you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound. If any of you listeners out there have been to SMAC, then you know what happens at SMAC stays at SMAC. Okay, who am I kidding? That's just bullcrap. SMAC is easily one of the most tweeted, blogged about, podcasted at medical conferences in the world. And if you're going to say some slimy, nasty BS about ultrasound, I don't care who you are, talking SMAC at SMAC, if you will, then we're going to hear about it. And we're going to make sure everyone else in the universe does too. So here we are finishing up with Smack or Das Smack in Berlin, and I've had the pleasure to hang out with Vicky a little bit, and you know we did a workshop at the beginning, and one thing is we kind of got this question a lot, and it was when do you use ultrasound? Should you be using ultrasound on everybody? It came up specifically with lung ultrasound. They wanted to know, do we do this lung ultrasound on everybody? And honestly, the answer to that surprisingly is no. It's not everybody. I mean, there are entire shifts where I don't touch an ultrasound machine. It's rare, but it happens. Do you think that maybe I'm doing something wrong? Am I harming my patients? No, I think, you know, like any tool, there are certain situations where it's absolutely crucial, and then there are certain situations where it's really helpful, but not crucial, and then there are certain situations where it's just nice and, you know, sort of patient-friendly and, and when you have time. Um, it's raining so yeah. hard. <laughs> we are in the middle of a Jesus. downpour. It was raining pretty heavy that day. I would say it's almost an analogy to how much education was going on at SMAC. And also that was like actually the quietest place that I could find where Vicky and I could talk. So sorry about all the noise and all the rain, but uh, we got to talk to Vicky. So that's a plus. So yeah, so there's those there's situations where you use it all the time because they're crucial. There's mm-hmm. situations where you use it because it's helpful and makes you faster. But there are situations where, you know, there's just the volume is too high or you're doing lots of other stuff and so you may not get to it before other pieces of data come back and then it's fine, you know. So I think it's just rational use is how kind of I describe it. And in any situation where I think it's going to make me faster or it's going to help the patient or it's going to impact my decision making, that's where I think it's crucial. But a lot of times, you know, it's just fun to do and, and I do it because of that. Yeah, actually, we'll do sometimes educational scans where I know that the patient's got a huge low bar pneumonia or a bad PE or an abscess. And I know I'll, sometimes I'll look just for the pulse cystalsis, like yeah. just for that. I'll go back and look. Because <laughs> it's so fun. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so what are your thoughts on like IVs? Should we be doing just ultrasound guided IVs on everybody? Uh, no, I don't think so. And, you know, certain there are plenty of people where you can really palpate a vein and there's good access and and it's you know a good skill to be able to do that um i do think that we under train the number of people that can use ultrasound so one of the things that happens sometimes is you have only a certain number of people that know how to do ultrasound guided ivs and then they're like the iv nurse for the entire department and so i think broadening access then means you don't have to do it as much because there's more people who can use it and lung ultrasound actually might be the same, you know, like if more people could do it, like nurses and paramedics and other people, maybe then you wouldn't be like the, you know, the ultrasound crazy person who's right. ultrasounding everyone because you would have that information already. But there's, you know, I think using it rationally and, and the other, you know, confession, which I will say here on the <laughs> podcast, is that there are times when I order a chest x-ray just because it's too busy, there's no room to examine the patient, there's nowhere private so I can look at their lungs um, uh, and so that's, a, you know, I do it. I give you permission to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So the I just did one of those uh, sauna bites. It's kind of fun um, on airway ultrasound. And one of the questions that I got a lot was, why should I do ultrasound to guide my intubations? Uh, do I need to do this on everybody? And the answer to that, kind of like with all things ultrasound, is no. You definitely don't need to do it on everybody. Wait, ultrasound for intubation? Jacob, I'm going to need you to explain yourself. Now there are two ways that you can use ultrasound to verify your endotracheal tube placement. You can use the direct method or the indirect method. The indirect method, which involves looking at the lungs and at the diaphragm after you ventilate a couple of times, is something that I'll talk about in a later podcast. What I'm going to talk about today is the direct method, which is looking at the trachea during or right after intubation. Now the best place to stick the probe is going to be in a suprasternal notch right here, right above that manubrium. You can use the curvilinear or the linear probe, and you'll get an image that hopefully looks something like this. 
right here you see a kind of a arch right here this is the trachea with air in it that's why you have the shadowing behind it and this little oval structure right here this is the esophagus it's always a good idea if you're doing this to make sure that you can find the trachea and the esophagus so you can see any changes in one or the other these are some amazing images from a study that was published in resuscitation in 2011. Now before intubation, you should see one air mucosal surface, which is basically one circular structure with some shadowing behind it. This is an air-filled trachea. During intubation, if you see a second air mucosal surface emerge, you've just created a second trachea-like structure in the patient's esophagus, which means you're in the wrong hole. Here's an example of a real-time clip that I either got from Mike Mallon, Mike Stone, or Matt Doss. I'm not really sure whose it is, but this is what a bad intubation looks like. So here we see one air mucosal surface, and then all of a sudden, boom, we see a second one. This one is in the esophagus and obviously in the wrong place, so you take it out and start over. Like you can see here in this example, there's that same esophagus, that same trachea. And when the trachea is intubated, we see just one air mucosal surface. You'll see a little bit of change in that air artifact within the trachea. It might be a combination of shadowing, A-lines, one or the other, or both. But you'll see a little bit of subtle change within it, and you won't see two air mucosal surfaces. Sometimes you won't be able to see the esophagus initially because it can be directly behind the trachea during intubation. This isn't really all that common, but if you intubate the esophagus that is directly behind the trachea, the air within the trachea can actually obscure your view of that esophageal intubation. There are a few ways you can get around that. One of them is looking laterally as close as possible to that suprasternal notch as you can. The other could be just to push the esophagus out from under the trachea by applying a little bit of pressure. But of course, don't overdo it. You don't want to get in the way of the actual intubation. The previous examples used a linear transducer, and some of the studies used that probe due to its higher frequency and the fact that it produces better looking images. In my experience, however, using that curvilinear probe is better. You get a better view of the trachea and surrounding structures, and you get a little more of kind of a bird's eye view, so you can see a little bit more. Sometimes using a linear probe is just a little too focused, and you can't see everything that's going on. It's definitely better if you can visualize the esophagus and the trachea before intubation. Like I mentioned before, you can move the probe laterally. Here's my neck and here I am drinking water. So you see the trachea here and I think my esophagus is there but I'm not sure so I check the other side. Nope, it's right there. So there's that little oval structure and just to make sure, drinking a little bit of water, you can see my esophagus light up there. Right there. Now here's what it looks like in real time using a curvilinear probe. This particular intubation was in a very controlled environment, and where I work, we have video laryngoscopy with standard MAC blades, so our residents can practice DL while we see exactly what they're seeing. This particular patient was being intubated by an off-service resident with not as much experience intubating. In this example, I was able to see exactly what the resident was doing with video while he or she attempted direct laryngoscopy. I had another operator scanning the neck. So you can see there we have good cords, we have the arretinoids, and here we have the corresponding ultrasound image. Trachea here, esophagus is somewhere underneath, and there are the carotids and the IJs. And you can see a second air mucosal surface right here emerge underneath the trachea, obviously in the wrong place. So we tell the resident to pull back, try again, and this time we see it go right into the trachea where it belongs. And if you look at the trachea right there, you can see that there's a little bit of change in that artifact that's coming from the trachea, but it's still essentially the same air artifact you saw before. On, um, on airway ultrasound, and one of the questions that I got a lot was, why should I do ultrasound to guide my intubations? Uh, do I need to do this on everybody? And the answer to that, kind of like with all things ultrasound, is no. You definitely don't need to do it on everybody. There are situations it's helpful, like if you have a new intubator that you don't trust, but you want them to learn DL, direct laryngoscopy, the ultrasound machine is crucial for that. If you have a difficult intubation, they anticipate being difficult, another crucial time to do it. But if you have somebody, your resin's intubating, you trust them, and you're comfortable, it's going to be an easy airway, you don't need to use the ultrasound. It is a tool. Ultrasound in general is a tool. It's something in your armamentarium to help you treat your patients and be a good physician. I mean, the ultrasound machine, I always say ultrasound machine is stupid. <laughs> it's a very dumb machine, and it takes you to figure out what to do with that information or to even use the information at all. And actually, during your Sonobite, I was sitting next to someone who um, works in a, a single coverage kind of community, D, and she said, the problem is I don't have anyone to hold the ultrasound probe. But actually, even in those settings, you always do have someone because you could use the ultrasound, have the nurse hold the probe, face the screen towards you, and then you have direct la uh, video laryngoscopy without even a, wow. a video yeah. laryngoscopy machine. So there are ways to use it and to use your help, whoever and wherever they are, um, and yeah. 
Uh, okay, so thanks for answering the question for us. Should I ultrasound everyone? Which I have no idea who asked, but Jacob, I'm going to give you a pass on it as I assume someone actually asks this. Also, going to publish this because Vicky's on it. Anytime we hear for Vicky, it's a good day. Now, the better question is who exactly should I ultrasound? When does it make a difference and how do I do it? Well, the only way to figure this out, obviously, is to come to a castle and learn. Or, I mean, I guess you could watch our other couple hundred episodes for free, but that's no fun. Come to the castle with us. I promise you, next episode, very soon, we're going to teach you some stuff that you can use on your next shift. Stay tuned. you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. Yeah, we can definitely do that, or we could be better clinicians and use our ultrasound.